Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second Chew on This training webinar. My name is Natalie Appleyard. I'm the Socioeconomic Policy Analyst at Citizens for Public Justice. And I'm joined with my Dignity for All uh, co-lead and colleague, Emily Renault from Canada Without Poverty, and Ruva Guacuare, who is the Public Justice Intern at Citizens for Public Justice. I'll be introducing our guest uh, very soon, but I'll just give a few more minutes for people to join. So thanks for being with us. My name is Natalie, and I am joining you from unceded Algonquin territory in what is now known as Ottawa. And um, happy to be here today and, and to be uh, joining with folks from across Turtle Island. And um, I'm going to invite um, both Craig and Sarisha to share a little bit about um, where they're from. Um, but again, just a reminder that uh, we are all treaty people. And so we want to be considering um, often when we acknowledge the lands and the territories that we are working or joining from, um, that's become pretty commonplace, but um, I just encourage each of us to consider what that means in terms of engaging with local uh, Indigenous communities and uh, amplifying the, the work and the leadership of many Indigenous-led organizations that uh, continue to lead in the fight for justice and, um, and sustainable um, uh, sustainability. So, um, Craig and Sarisha, I'm just going to ask you to say hello and uh, tell us where you're joining from. Sarisha, or do you want me to go? Go, go, Sarisha. Sure. Uh, yeah, so my name is Sarisha. Uh, I am calling in from unceded Algonquin territory, uh, colonially referred to as Ottawa, Ontario. I am the executive director for an organization called Leading in Color. Um, and what we focus on are issues uh, facing racialized communities and in particular racialized youth and how to advocate on behalf of ourselves and our communities. Um, and so I'm excited to be working with you today and, and talking to you. Um, I previously worked at Citizens for Public Justice and so I'm pretty familiar with Dignity for All um, and Chew on This. And so, yeah, excited to be here. Hi, Sarisha, it's great to meet you. My name is Craig Bergold. I'm uh, with the Ontario Basic Income Network and uh, I am located in Kingston, Ontario, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people. And I pay my respect to the elders and the custodians of the land and offer my solidarity. Um, so I'm looking forward to this conversation today and thank you so much, Natalie. Thanks to you both. And uh, just by way of introduction, um, again, maybe if you're joining this webinar, you have um, organized with Chew on This in the past, or uh, you're familiar with Chew on This or Dignity for All, maybe this is your first time. So welcome if you are new or a seasoned veteran. And um, so I just, I'll give a few words about the campaign and, um, and then we'll get started. And, and Craig's gonna share with us a little bit about his work in terms of bringing the arts into his political activism. Uh, he'll be looking at a, a sort of a case study of the Basic Income Now campaign. And then uh, Craig and Sarisha and I are gonna have just kind of an informal chat. Uh, we'll be off taking an opportunity for you to ask questions. And we'll just be sharing some, some ideas and learning from their wisdom and expertise on engaging uh, effectively with MPs and making sure that uh, you, that your message is, is heard and, and that we can build our collective impact. So for those who are not yet familiar with the campaign, uh, Chew on This is an annual anti-poverty campaign and it always takes place on or around October 17th, which is the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. And this year what we are asking people to do is to ask their MPs uh, from all political stripes to sign our pledge committing to specific targets and timelines that have to do with ending poverty in a way that is both effective, but also equitable. So currently the government of Canada has set a goal to reduce poverty by 50% of 2015 levels by the year 2030. But because we know that poverty disproportionately affects certain groups, uh, so speaking of First Nations, Inuit, Métis, people, Black, people of color, people who are disabled, people who are single, seniors, children, um, people who are two-spirit or LGBTQ. 
And uh, so we know that, again, that there's these certain groups that are already disproportionately impacted by poverty and um, that are excluded from policy decision making processes and accountability processes. And so with this target of 50%, we want to know who are the 50% who will be lifted out of poverty and liberated from poverty and who's going to be left behind. And we want to make sure that no one is left behind and that Canada sets ambitious targets that address the underlying inequity of our system. So you can see our full pledge and find all the details about how you can connect with your MPs either by sending a letter or by having a meeting or an event and that can be virtual or in person depending on your capacity and your comfort level. But we have all kinds of resources if you visit chewonthis.ca and you can find out more there. Um, but without further ado, I'm gonna invite Craig uh, to share with us a little bit about how, when we're engaging in political activism and when we're engaging with MPs, how can the arts in particular be used as a, as a tool to amplify our voices, to, to really send a strong message? So I'm going to share Craig's slides. And uh, Craig, why don't you go ahead and introduce the campaign a little bit while I do that? Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Sarisha. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, so myself, just a little background. I've, I've lived in poverty myself, um, so I just wanted to give a little bit of context. Um, so when I was a single father, I um, in my 20s, I had to use social assistance when I was raising my child. Um, I found it a very demeaning experience. Um, I found the uh, system to be focused more on clawing back money than actually supporting me. Eventually, so I'm an artist as well. And as you know, many artists deal with uh, poverty. Artists live um, in, most artists, live in poverty and I think in the Canada Council statistics it said artists make 46 percent less than the average worker in society and of course some professions like dancers make even less um, so you know CERB um, I, I collected CERB uh, when the pandemic hit and it was at that moment that um, I realized that basic incomes time had come and it is what precipitated me to suddenly put aside my graduate student work um, where I'm also living in poverty as a graduate student with debt. Um, I like to say the debt is like zombies that you know won't die they just keep coming back in a science fiction movie that's like reoccurring nightmare. Um, but um, so I got very involved in the uh, organizing artists to support basic income, but what I wanted to talk to you today about was something more recent and maybe we can, uh, I, I wanted to share with you uh, some of the lessons learned uh, in the basic income now campaign that took place during the federal election recently and just use it as a bit of a template to open up other discussion points. So yesterday I was on a call where we were debriefing the campaign and Stacey Rutland uh, from Income Movement in the USA brought up um, three core pillars of the, of the basic income movement. And I thought that those translated well for any social movement. So I just wanted to start by looking at um, grassroots and allies organizers and leadership and elected officials and government policy. And so I was inspired by hearing Stacy talk about the relationship between um, these elements. And, you know, a social movement has a demand. And in this case, it's for basic income. And we need to mobilize the grassroots and our allies and we need to change government policy. So there you see the one, two, three as, as kind of like a template of how some social movements operate. And of course, I firmly believe that organizers and leadership come out of the grassroots and, um, and um, they're an important middle, per, middle 
between the grassroots and the elected officials. So uh, next slide. So the grassroots uh, has tension with the political officials. They're different beings. And we need to, uh, to be effective, we need to engage with them in ways that um, we can uh, move our grassroots issues forward. And so there's skills that we need. In the uh, Basic Income Now campaign, uh, next slide, uh, we used art as an advocacy tool to mobilize the grassroots as a way to put pressure on the um, candidates, the MP candidates. So uh, we started in August with a partnership with all the leading basic income groups, uh, Basic Income Canada Network, Basic Income Canada Youth Network, Coalition Canada Basic Income and Revenue de Boss in um, Quebec, and also UBI Works. And this was the first time these organizations came together uh, under one banner to demand a basic income. And so activists from across the country used the Basic Income Now campaign uh, logo and slogan. Next slide. So this was our um, slogan, Basic Income Now. And so we had everybody agree on that. And then we created a logo. Next slide which was then used for lawn signs across the country. And these were Stratford, our affiliate in Stratford. So we have basic income has grassroots organizations at different municipalities across the country, as well as provincial organizations. This was the Stratford group. And I was so pleased when, cause I designed the logo. I was so pleased to see the first printing of them that came off the press, Carmen Grant uh, in Stratford made that happen. And she sent me the photos and I was like, oh my God, they look great. So let's, next slide. And so this is Peterborough. So Stratford started putting the lawn signs up around the country. And then um, Peterborough also ordered the signs. And you can see we used uh, variations of the logo and different communities could pick the colors uh, that were being offered. And um, so these, uh, and then this was the March in Toronto uh, before the election. And um, we also had t-shirts. And the reason why this is important is kind of, we talk about branding and I don't wanna use like corporate lingo, but it's important that uh, a message Basic Income Now uh, is used with a visual, um, a strong visual because it connects us from coast to coast to coast. So next slide. So again, this is in the Toronto rally, next slide. And this is in the Yukon. And what happens is you can see in the, the one picture on the right, somebody's got basic income now, but it's a hand painted sign. So this was something that I was trying to encourage was that all the grassroots groups to work with the artist run centers and smaller artist organizations in their communities as a way to create sign making events and to use arts as a way to motivate people to take a stand on an issue. Now, this all relates to um, um, getting our policy passed, which means eventually impacting elected officials. Because the elected officials respond to their constituents and they don't just respond to data. You can make a compelling case, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that because we do do that kind of work also. But we are at a point in, in the basic income movement where we need to put political pressure on the elected officials to begin to do the hard work of policy. So in this photo, it's in the Yukon. 
And uh, you can see here uh, one of the vice presidents from Public Service Alliance of Canada, who is a, a leader in that union, uh, is also working to end poverty in the Yukon. And so it's a way for allies to come under the slogan, basic income now. So many different organizations stepped forward and started to participate. Next slide. Uh, and so we were talking about coast to coast to coast. We held rallies right across the country. This was a chalk art event in Halifax. So Yukon to Halifax, artists came out and, and this is artists, you know, we're all artists to some degree, right? Everybody has a creative side, I believe. I, I also teach and I believe everybody has a story to tell when it comes to the arts. Um, and so we had chalk art, families participating, and it was participatory at the rally and there were speakers there. Next slide. Oh. And this rally was in Victoria, organized by the Basic Income British Columbia Group and Susan Abel. And Susan was able to bring the Raging Grannies out. I don't know if you know or heard of them, but they're a national kind of, you know, spontaneous grassroots organization of our most precious seniors who go around and compose songs at rallies. And this is a grassroots camp effort. So at these events, there were also politicians coming out to speak. So this is in Victoria. We went from the Yukon to Victoria to Halifax, Toronto. Next slide. Um, and I wanna show you a video that I produced uh, along with a group of, of people for the campaign, because not, also, not only is it important to uh, do um, on the ground work of rallies, it's important to be a part of the social media environment. So this was a social media PSA that we produced for that campaign. I can change my mind. I can change the world. I can be myself. A basic income lets me be the person I need to be. It gives me hope and support to reach my goals. Un revenu de base me permet d'être authentique. With a guaranteed livable income, we can all pay the rent and put food on the table. Care for a loved one, go back to school, start a new business. I can be myself. Okay. A basic income is a foundation for all of us. Inequality. Racism. Mental stress. Poverty. Homelessness. Precarious work. La pandémie. Les a aggravé. We must do better. We need basic income now. It's urgent, effective, affordable. With a basic income, my future won't depend on someone else's choices. I can move forward from trauma. Change will not break me. With basic income, I can show what I'm capable of. My contribution will count. I can volunteer. I can fight climate change. I can change the world. I can plan and have my chance. I will grow. Canada has enough to make sure everyone has enough. Basic income is about human dignity. It will spark creativity and new jobs. Vote for basic income now. Votez pour le revenu de base. Maintenant. Get involved. Vote for basic income now. Get involved. Vote for basic income now. That little video was part of uh, a social media campaign that started with a website. And the website is an important tool for bringing everybody together under one banner. It was a place where people could go see the video. It was a place where they could download the graphics to, to make the t-shirts, the logos. Um, and, and so that the same image was seen right across the country. But it was also something I, I want to focus more on, which was a place where you could go and um, contact your MP. So as you all know, MP writing candidates are moved by, I, I kind of constituents, I, I figure, is something they, they respond to, party policy and media. And the role of constituents is what we saw earlier in this presentation. It's the constituents going out, making media, having rallies, 
but when you go back to the website, next uh, slide, please. There was what we called the candidate pledge campaign. And this campaign allowed people to look up their candidates based on their uh, postal codes. And it allowed them to, from the website, to send a letter to the candidates to take a pledge for basic income. And um, the effectiveness of that campaign is based on the constituents reaching out to those candidates who are running for office. And um, this is an example from the website. Now, this website was uh, handled mostly by UBI Works, who did some amazing, amazing heavy lifting. Next slide. So on the website, um, you could sign a petition to support basic income. You can see there the database is 82,000 people. So what that allowed the campaign to do is identify individual ridings based on postal codes and send targeted emails to the constituents in those ridings that already supported basic income and asking them to contact their local MPs through the, the if you go back one, through, the, through this. So we were able to, the campaign was able to target all of our supporters in different riding. So if you go back one more, in the riding of Davenport, there was a basic income champion, Julie Zirovich from the Liberal Party. And so when, once they took that pledge to support basic income, we, uh, uh, the campaign created these memes. This was actually, I believe, the work of Liam and Ken at UBI Works producing these memes. And what this did is it um, showed the, the, the candidates that there's um, that the constituents can see that they've taken the pledge. So it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship. On the one hand, you're going out asking them to take the pledge. And then on the other, once they've taken the pledge, you're advertising their support. And then the competition in Davenport riding also took the pledge. So you had two political parties because we're a nonpartisan uh, movement campaign. Uh, and both candidates in that riding took the pledge. And so that's an example of how we were able to move our um, issues forward with some of the MP candidates. So I'll just go forward a couple slides and then there's one of the Green Party. So we have uh, a new Green Party MP uh, in Kitchener who took the pledge. And again, if you're a basic income supporter in the Kitchener Center riding, and you see this meme, you're gonna be more inclined if that's your issue to support this candidate. So we're, we're very happy to see that there's also a Green Party as well supporting it. Um, next slide. So this is an example of where a candidate, and these are all the candidate um, uh, office workers who are working on the campaign. So this MP candidate, actually their whole staff and everybody got the signs and took a picture and sent it out across social media. So again, now the MPs are actually, the candidates are embracing our slogans and our images. Next slide. Now I wanna talk a little bit about once they're elected. So that was the campaign that we went through. But over the last two years, um, Ontario Basic Income Network has been doing, uh, working with sitting MPs. So once a year, we've had a, um, what we call Lobby Days on Parliament Hill. And we're actually uh, gearing up in November to do one for the upcoming Ontario MPPs because there's an Ontario election in, um, 
in June. So we're going to be organizing one-on-one -on -one meetings with MPs. Now, one of the things that I've learned from working with Barbara Borax, at, who is uh, organized the one last year for MPs and with Katerina Lindman, who's organizing this year's, is that those one-on-one -on -one meetings is an opportunity to answer questions. And it's really important to have what I call stakeholder research, a, a short one or two page paper that you can present uh, at the same time that you meet with them as background material. Next slide. Um, I also wanted to point, I put in the chat, there's a resource on how to talk to politicians about basic income. It's a one hour webinar done with the Basic Income Canada Youth Network and Ontario Basic Income Network. And they, they go over some of the details that we, won't, we might not be able to cover today, uh, writing letters, and as well as um, this one pager called Building Effective Relationships with MPPs. And I think we'll get a chance to talk more with Sarisha and others about some of these techniques, but I just wanted to point out the resources that are available. And I put the links there and you can download those. Next slide. Um, I talked a little bit about the case for basic income and the arts. Another strategy that we use, next slide, was writing a public letter, which we did uh, a year ago, um, which was bringing a whole bunch of people together around like a coalition around an open public letter and then sending that to your elected representatives. We did this in the arts campaign. So that's another type of strategy. Um, and that got media attention because the coalition was quite large. I think about organizations representing 70,000, 75,000 signed that open letter that we then sent to the elected MPs to push policy um, forward. So we've talked about candidate pledges, we've talked about advocacy weeks, we've talked about open public letters. I think that might be the, is there one more slide? Oh, it's, this is a lovely drawing that my daughter uh, made for me, gifted to me, I, I would say, because it's unpaid labor. Um, and it's uh, Precarious Angels, which is my um, handle. Thank you. I talk about it so much, she decided to, to make a nice drawing for me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Craig. Um, if folks have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we're going to continue. I have a few questions that I'm going to put to Sarisha and Craig. Uh, please feel free to, you know, discuss amongst uh, with each other as well. Um, but just so um, following up on on some of the um, the great case study that that Craig has has shared with us of the basic income campaign and the use of the arts in that. Um, I'm just curious if uh, if you'd like to speak to this and maybe Sarisha, you can start. Um, what tips would you give to someone who has never engaged with their MP before? So like, why should they try it? What have you found works well for people that are just getting started with political engagement? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing that I always hear, especially from youth, is that they're intimidated or scared to, to meet with an MP or to talk to their MP or their representatives. Um, and the biggest thing that I've learned in sort of handling that power dynamic and, and imbalance is realizing if you're over the age of 18 and you are a citizen and you vote that it's your right to engage with these folks that they work for you not the other way around um and so to use that as a way to sort of ideologically in your head try and shift the power a little bit and give yourself a little bit more confidence um i think that's the first sort of step the second is being as concise as possible I would say um, a lot of the time when you go into a meeting with a, a member of parliament, they obviously have their own agendas um, and they listen to you because you're their constituent, but you want to make sure that you're providing a space um, that gets your point across in the most, uh, the simplest way, for example. Um, so making sure you go in with like two to three key points as opposed to like a whole list of demands um, is helpful. 
uh, providing some context and background for what you do and why you're an expert or, or a person in this area, whether it's lived experience, professional experience, whatever it is, um, but creating basically a foundation that they can build off of and engage with with you. Um, I think that's where I would start. And I found that that works really well, um, especially for young folks, um, but for people with lived experience as well. Like Craig, I also have lived experience in poverty. Um, and so bringing that to the forefront and saying, this is what I'm experiencing um, and whatever the policies they have in place are, are clearly not helping, right? So providing that lived experience as an example um, is really helpful. And I know it can be difficult, especially for marginalized communities to sort of feel like you're um, exploiting your own trauma a lot of the time, right? And so going into it in a way where you feel like you have the power is really helpful. Um, and so, yeah, so trying to, to mimic that power imbalance and, and make those changes for yourself mentally and then going in with clear and concise um, foundation of, of what it is you're looking for is, is my most helpful tip. Thanks, Risha. Feel free to jump in, Craig. This can be a back and forth conversation. You don't have to wait for me to, uh, to intervene. Okay. So Sarisha, um, just following up on that, my question would be, so when you talked about that, you, I, I'm wondering what's the relationship between the person and, and their cause? Like how, how does that work with meeting with the MP? Are you just telling a personal, I guess I'm feeding you a question. Like, are you just telling a, a personal story or are you like, do you have an agenda? I think you always have an agenda, right? So like what whatever your particular issue area is. So thinking of chew on this, like whether you're talking about uh, food insecurity or whether you're talking about housing or income, whatever um, the, the issue at hand is, um, you're going in with an agenda, but they also have an agenda, right? And so um, my biggest struggle has always been that my representatives have never been aligned ideologically with where um, I come from in terms of an anti-poverty framework, right? Um, and so trying to find some sort of common ground is often very difficult. And the easiest way I found to do that is to build sort of that lived experience into it and say, like, pe the, the goal is for people not to dismiss your lived experience, right? Not to say that that won't happen, um, but that you're bringing in this is what's happened to you. This is what's happened to your communities in particular. And as a constituent, this is what you want to see them change for the betterment of not just you, but your community. Yeah, so I, I find in the basic income work when we meet with MPs, there's a lot of misunderstanding. So whatever your issue is, don't think just because they're an elected MP, they actually know what that issue is. Because first of all, you have lived experience. And two, you're also coming with some what I call stakeholder research. Like you've got a one pager, you've done the heavy lifting, you know the issue. And often it's about trying to get an audience just to listen and to ask their questions. And for example, one of the questions we always have to deal with is UBI, which is like sending a check to everybody versus uh, basic income guarantee, which is income tested. So we need to clarify what the misconceptions are about the policies that we we would like to see develop. So I find it's really important, like, especially if you're a young person and you've got, you know, you can be an expert on an issue. And just because they're an elected MP doesn't mean that they know all of the things. They may know some things, but what I find with the advocacy week is it provides a window that where you can run a campaign. It doesn't have to be just over a week. It could be longer, a month. You call it a week thing, but then you try to schedule meetings with multiple MPs to push the ball up the hill with these elected politicians. Sarisha, have you found to, um, so uh, Sarisha is the uh, founder and, and director of Leading in Color, as I, I believe you mentioned earlier, Sarisha. And so with, um, with folks in your network, are you finding that there are examples of, um, you know, these meetings, um, engendering a source of empowerment like you're I, I really appreciate that you named that power dynamic that uh, that exists there and um, and even you know even if you don't feel like you're a policy expert um, you know just making sure that like your MP knows that these are the issues you care about because it's really their job to find out about them right and to and to research them so we do do a lot of the heavy lifting for them but you know that that's not actually our job so I'm just wondering um, if 
um, you know, if you found for, for the youth that you work with um, or for yourself that, um, you know, having gone through this experience, you know, have, have there been some, has that shifted the, the way you feel that power dynamic or, um, or, you know, in cases where it has maybe not turned out in terms of uh, the other person's agenda, you know, are there some tips for, for maybe dealing with that as well? Yeah, for sure. I think in my personal experience, I found it quite empowering and, and that has a lot to do with privilege. Um, in that one, I have a story of like, I used to live in poverty and, and now I no longer live in poverty. And so um, that's very appealing to government, right? To see what, what is it that got you out of there? Um, and so being able to position myself as sort of an expert in, in how I and my family were able to pull ourselves out of poverty is what I think has given me confidence in those sort of settings. But when I was still living in poverty and having those meetings, it definitely wasn't the same feeling, like that power dynamic still existed. Um, and so the biggest way that I was able to combat that was really being like pushing, pushing the vote, right? Is like, if you want me to vote for you, this is what I want to see. Um, and if, if they think that your vote matters, then this is what they need to do if they want to get reelected, right? Um, or elected in a, in a new election. Um, and so, yeah, so some of the maybe challenges and, and tips I've seen are just uh, trying to like internally combat that can be very difficult for folks, right? Because these power dynamics are not just about an MP versus an individual. Like if you're racialized, if you're disabled, if you're marginalized in some way, there's all these different things that happen at once. And if you have, um, if you put like an intersectional analysis on it, for some of us, it's a lot more difficult than for others, right? Um, and so being able to, to combat that internally, I think is, can be a little bit of a struggle. Um, and so the tips that I would say is like coalition building has been really helpful, right? Going in with more than one person, um, being able to expand your voice and give you some confidence, but also for them to see that it's not just you, there's multiple people. Um, and coalitions don't have to be big organizations. They can be you and a group of your friends, right? Or you and a group of other people who are constituents in, in the same place. Um, and so, yeah, that has been helpful to further empower me, I think, and the youth that I work with, um, but really being able to name and address those power dynamics um, and then do something about them, whatever, whatever specifically needs to be done. Mm, that's a great point. Thanks, Trisha. And I, and I think that uh, ties into some of what we're asking for in terms of our targets and timelines with Chu on this is recognizing that this power imbalance exists uh, so, such that the people that are most disproportionately impacted by policy decisions that have to do with poverty, um, which of course, as we know, has many, many, many different manifestations uh, are you know, typically excluded from these processes um, because of these empower balances. So th this is specifically something that we're asking for that um, and something that folks can point to in terms of, you know, maybe even naming it in your meeting saying like, I'm coming to you as so-and-so and I'm speaking to you in your position of privilege and power. And, you know, naming these things and saying like, this is why this matters. Um, you know, other people, you know, uh, maybe don't feel comfortable doing this or have, don't have the opportunity uh, or don't have the privilege of doing this. So that's great. Um, so I'm gonna ask now, I, I know that there are folks in our meeting today and, and listening to the recording afterwards, I assume, who are more seasoned veterans um, who have been at this for a while. And, you know, we've all had uh, experiences where, you know, you're going into an MP who, you know, pretty much agrees with you. And, and Craig, I appreciated on the resource that you shared that there were contingency plans for whether it was a, a yes or a non-committal or a outright no. And so I'm just wondering, um, you know, for folks who maybe have been at this for a while, maybe there's an MP that's been around for a while or that they just know, you know, that their party is not going to support this. But, um, you know, what, what tips or strategies would you suggest that folks uh, engage there? Uh, goes you want to start, Craig? No, no, you go. Okay. I've, I've, I've ta I talked a lot at the beginning. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, so I think that that has been my life, is <laughs> that they never agree with what I'm putting forward. Um, and so the one thing that I've found uh, helpful to do, but can be very difficult, and so I wouldn't recommend it for everybody, um, but is finding some sort of common ground and root that common ground in privilege. So for example, um, more often than not, my representatives tend to be much older white men uh, who are Christian. 
And so I tend to, coming from CPJ, I tend to, to bond with them over the fact that, that we have a shared religious identity of, in some way. Um, and that has actually opened a lot of doors for me in being able to get my, my voice heard by folks who don't necessarily agree with what I'm putting forward. Um, and so finding common ground in, in some sort of personal way and building a personal relationship like that has been helpful for me. Um, however, it's not always the the safest thing for a lot of folks to be able to do, right? Um, and it has that element of privilege again. If you're coming from marginalized identities where you just have to go and, and share yourself with somebody who has no interest in you and, and doesn't really care about what you have to say, that can be quite challenging. And so that's where I think, again, coalition, like being with other people is really helpful to have that support and show that it's beyond yourself, but then also finding ways to sort of negotiate uh, policy, I guess. So um, for the most part in Canada, we have like some relationship uh, across the parties in terms of policy. Um, even if they're vastly different implementations, there's some understanding. Um, and so really testing and pulling on, on some of those strings, like why is it that you don't agree with a basic income, for example, or, or why is it that you're not interested in supporting X, Y, Z? Um, and finding questions that are very like yes or no based, I found really helpful. Um, so going in there and saying, uh, if you want to be a little bit more aggressive in your approach saying like, well, why do you not support everybody having the right to live like free and healthy lives? Why do you not support people having housing and roofs over their heads? Why do you support homelessness? Um, framing things in a way that is, is very clear and concise and it requires an answer, right? Because if you go in there and say, why do you support people not having access to food? Like what, the, the, what's the response gonna be, right? And so you have to kind of play the game a little bit um, which again is not for everybody, especially within the colonial systems that we work with. Um, but finding ways to, to just like poke at things, I think is, is really helpful. Um, and it takes a little bit of creativity, um, but you'll, as you practice and, and get to know how others are doing it, again, that coalition piece is really important. So you can take tips from how others share their information, how others um, are prodding questions and sort of plan out how you want to do it. So if one person says, one topic question, then you say another. Um, or if you're going to somebody who's just like, no, 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 like we just don't agree with you. Maybe you have the same question asked in like 10 different ways <laughs> um, and try and get an answer from them, right? So it's about being persistent and, and consistent at the same time, but also allowing yourself to be a little bit creative um, because that is a hard space to be in. Um, personal relationships are really important with the MPs and the elected officials. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the tension between the grassroots and the elected officials. And uh, Sarisha mentioned just now, the uh, it's not for everybody. But what I, what I do want to say is that I can't stress enough how much of it is about relationship building between individuals. And that is separate from what you do on the street. Now, in my other role as a union uh, president for many years, we would often be in bargaining and we would want to have a demonstration at the MP's office. So we, we had a personal relationship with the constituency office manager or office manager. And so when we showed up, we had already contacted them ahead of time. We told them we were coming. We, we, we explained to them, we, at, we said we wanted to have a meeting ahead of time. Uh, it's about developing the personal relationship with the individuals as well. You can do your stuff out on the street, but you also have to maintain a personal relationship with the individuals who are your representatives, unless of course they're like totally bad mouthing you. I'm not suggesting that. But what, I, what I'm trying to point out is that sometimes to get to the MP, you have to go through the constituency office or you have to go through their staff person. And those are really important relationships to build up over time. Your issue might not be won right away in one election round, but you've built the personal relationship so that in the next sitting of government, you have more allies to work with. And what a lot of politicians respond to is political pressure. And so 
you need to build that pressure across many different platforms in the street, letters to the editor, social media, um, uh, leaders in the community standing with you, building coalitions like Sarisha mentioned. It's part of a campaign, should I say. Um, and there's many different levels in that campaign. And like I said, personal relationships are really, really important to maintain. Yeah, I think that segues nicely to my last question that I'm gonna to put to you before we, uh, before we call it an hour. Um, if anyone else has questions in the chat, uh, do send them in and, and we'll try to make time for those as well. Um, but um, so we are kind of talking about how there's sort of like a, a spectrum of ways that we are going to be applying political pressure, right? There's, um, for some people, it is going to be unsafe or, um, or you know, just unpalatable to um, to be in that relationship building space. So that might not be your that might not be your role in the movement. Um, others will have a role in the movement that are really going to push the envelope. That are really um, going to get out there and uh you know do the demonstration and uh and not be in a position where they're willing to compromise on any messaging or anything like that and then there might be other people that are kind of needling away at <laughs> at um you know the policy work and finding common ground and finding those um those weak spots so that we can chip away at so there uh, there is a range in any movement and um i don't think anyone should feel like they have to be all things in any one movement um, that it takes all of us. And I think that's um, that's something that I feel like, uh, you know, when we talk about the arts and advocacy, um, you know, some people that is gonna be the passion and the creativity that, uh, that they bring. And that is how they're going to communicate that message most powerfully to help develop that public will that will then push the political will, as you said, Craig, earlier, to then do the hard work of the actual policy making, right? And I think what, what we're trying to do in, um, in our asks with Chew on This and Dignity for All is making sure that while we might have different roles in the movement, that everyone still has a say when it comes time to that policy making so that we're not sacrificing the integrity of what we're looking for you know, when it, when it comes time. And so um, making sure that, again, that the folks that are typically marginalized from these decision-making processes um, also have a say and, um, and that there are accountability mechanisms built in so that they will always have a say. And um, so I guess, uh, sorry, that was a long preamble to what will be a question, um, but that is just, um, you know, what are some, um, what are some stories or some what inspires you in terms of like where there's real potential to bring uh, to build the kind of public pressure that's required to bring about meaningful change? So um, maybe Sarisha, we'll start with you. Yeah, I'll try and well, I am nonpartisan, but I will try and be as as much as I can. Uh, we just had an election. Right. Um, there's a lot of discourse on whether or not we should have had an election. Um, but I think right now in Canadian politics is a, a big time to have the government prove itself. Um, and so I think one of the biggest strategies now in terms of public pressure is demanding that they prove themselves. Right. Like you've had X amount of time to implement all these things you said you were going to implement, including conversations around things like basic income and food security. Uh, clean water, like access that things that, um, to things that people who are living in poverty need, um, and you haven't done it. So how do we pressure them to, to answer for that? Um, and that could be through meetings, that could be through demonstrations, that whatever tactic you want to use, um, but really holding people accountable, I think right now, is the biggest way to, to put pressure because the, the work has already been done for the past, what, five years um, that we've had. So that's part of it. I think um, one of the things that you mentioned about um, like everybody having a role to play is really, really important, right? So like I have folks that I work with who are particularly Indigenous youth who have no interest in having meetings with MPs and that's totally fine. Um, and you probably won't see me engage with MPs the same way that I, I used to. Like I'm not gonna go in there and talk about my, <laughs> my religious identity with them anymore because um, we're at a different space, right? And so for Chew on this specifically, for example, 
I started and my biggest contribution, perhaps the first year I was doing it was building a sign, like literally making a sign that we took up to Parliament Hill. Um, and that sign has been in a lot of photos now. And from those photos, people have reached out to me and asked me to participate in different things. And it's given me access to spaces, right? Like people are like, oh, I saw you up on the hill with that sign. Do you want to meet with this person? Or I saw you in this pamphlet. Do you want to meet with somebody? Um, and so things are coming my way as a result of such a small act of literally taking 10 minutes to build a poster to take to a rally. Um, and that was part of Chew on This, right? And now I have the space to, to lead a conversation like this. Um, and so that dynamic sort of changes. Like one year you could be you could be making signs and handing out apples and another year, thank you. <laughs> it is my claim to fame is that poster. Um, and another year you could be organizing for your whole community to be organizers and Chew on This, right? Um, and so taking sort of the, the time to recognize where your skill set is, where your comfortability is, and what is safe and accessible for you um, is really important for you to be able to then have the potential to build some public pressure um, and use your role in a way that's meaningful, um, but also to use your privilege in like a manageable way um, and an effective way. Um, so something that we do in, in the work that I do is there's a lot of us who come from, uh, or not a lot of us, there's some of us who come from like higher income status places and have more access to powerful people. And they use that to get the door, their foot in the door for the rest of us to follow through. Um, and so having people play specific roles is really helpful, but really using that privilege is, is what it is. So if I have somebody who's not comfortable meeting with an MP, but I am, I can build that relationship and then the other person can, can follow through um, with whatever it is that they want to do. I don't know if I'm explaining that very well, but basically you're, you're opening the door for people, right? Um, and you don't have to take up all the space in the doorway while you open that door um, is the analogy I'm going to use. Um, but yeah, I think the, the biggest thing right now for public pressure is using some of those tactics to hold the government accountable um, and say like, we have the answer. Uh, dignity for all is, is how many years old now? <laughs> Over a decade, right? Um, so we have a, a solution here for you. Why do you not want to implement it? And what is it going to take for you to implement it? Um, and that's not just dignity for all. Like we have advocates and coalitions from everywhere doing this work, right? And so um, how do you come together and, and pressure the government is by joining forces, by running social media campaigns, by going to demonstrations and holding rallies. There's a bunch of different tactics, but it's really about making them accountable to what they've said or what they've said that they won't do and challenge them as to why they won't do it. Great. Final uh, thoughts, Craig? Uh, lovely point there, Sarisha, about using privilege. Um, tell a very short story about a migrant worker uh, activist from Justicia who was being deported uh, a couple years ago. And uh, because we had a close relationship um, at the union, we always met with the constituency office, which was a liberal uh, MP. Um, we were able to ask the liberal MP to deliver a letter for us and their staff on behalf of the, the, the migrant worker who was going to be deported. We ended up using our privilege and access in relationship building to speak up on behalf for those who are having trouble reaching those who were making decisions about them. So it's not about compromise. When we talk about relationship building, it's not about compromise. It's about doing it in a way that allows for dialogue to take place and for those differences to be clearly understood and when you do have something that is where you can find uh, points of unity on, you can move it forward. And in that case, we were able to stop the deportation as a small part of a larger campaign. Um, and we intervened at the like within the 24 hours before the deportation order, and it played a small part. So that's just a simple example of standing up for an activist who's working on the front lines and using privilege and relationship building, why it's important, because it benefits Thanks. the whole community. Thanks, Craig, that's great. And I think again, uh, the point that uh, I'd like to reiterate again with the, the campaign and, and our asks is that we wanna use that privilege to make sure that then we're not the only ones with that privilege going forward too. So um, that's a great example, Craig, of, of you know a really you know life or death, situation probably where that 
where that made a difference, right? So thank you both uh, for being here with us today. We are just past two o'clock um, and I haven't seen any uh, questions come in, but I'm sure that there's uh, a lot of uh, information and material that you've given people to chew on, pardon the pun. And uh, so thanks so much for being with us. You can find out more about uh, the Chew On This campaign at chewonthis.ca. You can find Sarisha at Leading in Color and you can find Craig, I'm just, just for ease, I'm gonna say on Twitter at Precarious Angel. I wanna thank you both for being with us and uh, thank you everyone who uh, was listening in today. And um, let's let's keep working together to build this political pressure. I think we've we've seen these um, these big changes. I, you know, I think a few years ago, um, yeah, we never would have had a, an election where every party had to have something to say about climate change, and now we do, right? And that's the result of, of public pressure, public mobilization. And I think uh, same way we're seeing a lot of great uh, momentum in the basic income movement. So uh, kudos to everyone involved with that. And uh, again, thanks to you both. And uh, I hope that you'll be joining us for our Chew on This campaign this year. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>